Howdy, howdy folks, good morning, good afternoon, good evening and good night if you're joining me here nice and early over at Howling Minds. Welcome on in, hopefully all is well with you, much like it is with me and hopefully it remains in the world of flesh and blood. We're back today for another dedicated deck tech video, haven't had a chance to do one of these in a while but I've been working on a number of pet projects since Dynasty released, a um, number of decks that you know, maybe you're on the fringes, aren't quite there, could do with a bit of refinement. Uh, and we've got a bit of an off-season from competitive play, so I've kind of been working on some more of these pet projects, trying to tweak them and find if I can find anything there um, in that season. Especially given that I don't think Icelander, unfortunately, has too many new toys from Dynasty. It's been fun to explore other decks and see exactly what it is that we can do. As you might notice on screen right now, one of those pet decks has actually been a very different version of Dramai uh, than the current most common versions of the deck uh, focused around a different weapon in the form of Iris of Reality. If you aren't familiar with Iris of Reality, this lovely card here, uh, during your action phase, illusionist auras you control are weapons. They have four attack and they say once per turn, spend three, attack with them, go again. Um, which is, you know, pretty great because it gives the attacks go again, essentially, is the important part there. Um, so you can chain off multiple aura attacks in one go to push an awful lot of damage. It's a card that never really found a home because three is quite a lot for an, uh, uh, yeah, attacking with an aura to cost. Prism was always built around yellows. Jeremiah traditionally built around reds. So it never has really found a home in this kind of shell. And of course, Dynasty did release a small handful of support to more of an aura-based illusionist. But funnily enough, we're actually not using very many of those cards at all in supporting this game plan. It turns out there are different ways to try and utilize Dromai's kit to give you a different way of playing the game as opposed to being so reliant on dragons or being a hard control deck and that's very much what we're trying to do here. You'll find this deck operates on two game plans that can adjust slightly depending on who you're playing against or how the matchup is going. You're either going to be looking to uh, block with two cards and keep a hand that comes back with a big attack. Now we've seen this from Icelander players many many times at this point. Coming in with an attack that is above rate in for 7 or 8 or 9 uh, off of a 2 card hand is a very strong turn especially if your opponent can't pop it. Now of course we're giving up the equity we would have of playing something like Wounded Bull to play illusionist attacks that are more powerful cards, but of course susceptible to getting popped. So how do we circumvent that being bad for us in matchups where our, our attacks can get popped? Well, that's where our second plan comes in, and we can rely on Iris of Reality to present a number of auras with Spectra that those classes that would normally be full of poppers should have a problem dealing with. You see, most of those classes, most of the Guardians, for example, have a tough time attacking you multiple times over the course of a turn, and they really don't play well into Spectra at all, which means if you can establish multiple auras and get swinging those with iris of reality you don't have to worry about your cards getting popped or playing to a late game ghostly touch so that's kind of the core concept of how we've built this version of dramai what i'm going to do for you today is kind of walk you through everything card by card then walk you briefly through some of the sideboard plans for matchups but if you're looking for a certain matchup you want to see how we board it will be time stamped for you in the description box below you can go and check it out down there all i ask in return for this video is one simple thing if you are enjoying the content here at howling minds I know it's not as consistent as I'd like it to be, um, but please do consider subscribing here on the channel. Doing my best to work on Flesh and Blood stuff over here while my full-time job over at Marvel Snap Zone is going so well. Uh, and I appreciate the love and the support in doing so. So like the video, share it with your friends, share this deck tech if you appreciate that kind of stuff. And just support me over here uh, with a subscription, it would be massively appreciated. So, going to start things off with your regular armor suite for this deck. Uh, Crown of Providence is going to be your headpiece of choice for the most part. This card is... Even better than normal in this deck. Gives you some um, protection, just good armor that blocks. But also, you are very, very blue heavy. As we're about to see you moving forward, there is uh, 36 blues in this list in total. You don't always play 36, but you always play a minimum of 33. Uh, so you'll often find yourself in situations where your hand didn't have any natural go again. You didn't have a ton of auras in play. Your opponent chose to just swing at a Spectra aura and pass. And you've got a full hand that isn't doing an awful lot. Uh, Crown of Providence can incidentally block attacks before before they attack the aura to kind of help you filter things through. But more importantly, it's going to clear out random blues that got stuck in your arsenal on those turns. You'll find if they swang at an aura, you've got three cards. You can only you know, send an attack at them for eight, nine, whatever. An arsenal of blue that you don't really want. Crown of Providence is very, very good at clearing away that blue that was stuck in your hand and turning it into a real card. 
Findle Spring Tunic is a fantastic addition to this deck. Not only is there not really a better chess piece, we could definitely consider something like Flame Scale Furnace, but we're not red heavy enough to make the most of that. It would mostly just be here blocking for three. Instead, we get to utilize Findle Spring Tunic alongside Phantasmal Footsteps, alongside cards like Blue Brothers in Arms, Oasis Respite, and even a few other corner case scenarios we'll get into a little bit later on, where that extra resource really does go a long way in helping you have more functional turns. One of my favorite play patterns with this deck is actually with the card Miraging Metamorph that we'll talk about a little bit later on, where you can quite often keep a two card hand, spend your tunic resource to attack with Metamorph and Arsenal a card, or simply keep a one card hand and attack for seven off of your tunic, a play pattern basically no other hero has access to. Iris of Reality, we just talked about briefly. It's our weapon of choice in every single matchup. We are built to utilize it. We are built around it. It's our core game piece. But of course, it does mean we don't have a traditional weapon. So when we're looking at our deck building choices in certain matchups, you're going to have to remember whether or not it's easy for us to defend our auras, quite difficult for us to defend our auras, and decide whether or not we need to go fast or slow based on that information. Phantasmal Footsteps is the leg piece you're playing more often than any other. There are a few other options in the sideboard we'll get to very shortly. The most contentious one is Mage Master Boots. Now, Mage Master Boots is in this list, and it's very, very good in this list. We'll talk about exactly what it's for at this moment in time later on. However, I am kind of interested to see in my testing moving forward if I should just always be playing Mage Master Boots when I go first. It's something I've been toying with in testing. You might have even seen it on one or two of the games on the channel already, which you can check out if you haven't done so already. Um, but there's obviously very, very high upside in being able to just pop boots on turn zero, play two blue auras and pass. That's a really, really strong play pattern. And it also in a pinch can generate some ash for you, which is not nothing in certain sideboard plans for this deck. That being said, for the most part, we play Mage Masters in matchups where it's definitely, definitely good. And we play Phantasmal Footsteps in matchups where utilizing our blues to their fullest extent is important. Or that extra block value to turn off important on hit triggers ends up being very important too. You'll notice as we go into our game plans a bit later, there are a number of ways for us to spend resources in our opponent's turn and Phantasmal Footsteps is one of them and it lets us use these blues kind of doing an old impression with Crown of Seeds and Rampart to kind of utilize a blue to block for significantly more than we would do otherwise and I'm not entirely sure that giving that up to have that high roll potential of two auras on turn zero is worth it in the matchups where Footsteps is good. Additionally this card obviously very powerful in a number of matchups where they have limited poppers. You'll notice that we play Mage Master Boots into a lot of matchups where poppers are pretty common because we're not going to be looking to pay for that action point or block with our equipment uh, in, on our feet because they're all big attacks that we'd never want to shatter our footsteps for. Uh, but in matchups where the on-hit triggers matter and they have limited numbers of poppers, being able to pay our extra resource and play out an aura afterwards also a very valuable piece of text. The main arm piece here is, however, the only new card from Dynasty that currently makes the cut in this version of the list, and that is Wave of Reality. This is a card that I get a lot of questions about. People don't necessarily think is very good. I have to respectfully disagree. This card is one of the reasons why I actually gave this deck a go in the first place, and we were playing a lot more Dynasty cards when we first put it together, but we've refined those down as we've gone. This one has stayed the course. The easiest way to think about this card is a arm piece that blocks two, but you don't get control over her when you use it. Now, that doesn't sound great, but of course, Illusionist does not normally get arm pieces that block two outside of something like Ironhide Gauntlet. So that is a pretty good rate, and of course, if you just take a hit, it will shatter, as will the shield you make from it to guarantee you that two health from a piece of equipment. But this card is way, way more than that. What you can do in a lot of spots, for example, is deliberately leak one damage to create a spectral shield. And a spectral shield in this version of the deck is actually worth quite a lot. Not only are you then going to be preventing two damage when the shield eventually pops, but hopefully you get to attack for four with that shield as well at certain points. So deliberately leaking one at the end of a combat chain can actually go a very long way in giving you a weapon to attack with on the following turn, which creates some super interesting play patterns. You'll also notice as we go into the deck a little further that maximizing your auras to be able to use your all blue hands is very, very important. So more ways of creating spectral shields is always valuable, especially when it is tacked onto a piece of equipment that does incidentally block two damage over the course of a game. This card is pretty underrated in my opinion right now. I do think you have way more control about when it breaks than most people think you do. Uh, and I've been pleasantly surprised so far and I highly recommend giving this a shake if you're trying out a list like this one that can utilize that spectral shield. So you'll notice that we're on our core of our deck currently, which so 
for those people that, that maybe aren't regular fans of the channel, I do sideboards. I don't do the, the taking stuff away plan that some people do with their decks in Flesh and Blood. I'll always give a sideboard and bring stuff in and occasionally bring stuff out. But for the most part, I'll set up the core of a deck, the, the cards I play in every matchup, and then break off the stuff that I don't play in every matchup and tell you what I would and wouldn't play in each matchup depending. So the 51 cards you're about to see are the cards that I play in every matchup. There is exactly one exception to that rule, where in the Draw My Mirror, I do not play Oasis Respite because I don't think you ever want to be the defensive one in that mirror match and be playing toys that defend. So it goes out in that matchup, but it does see play in every other one, so it does make the cut in the core. So you'll find that for the most part, you are bringing in nine cards from your sideboard selection in each and every matchup to join this bunch. This is 33 blues. I don't think you can ever go, 33, uh, go below 33 blues um, as a result of uh, the way the deck is designed to play. And you'll notice that, of course, in many matchups, one of those cards we choose to bring in is actually our extra blue just to up that count slightly. That might be for Icelander. That might be for matchups where attacking with auras is more important. So we want to make sure we have more blues in our hand. But there are some times where we play the blue not because of its card text, but because we want extra blues in that matchup. So do keep it in mind. Our first is Blue Brothers in Arms. This is actually one of the biggest innovations to this deck that we didn't start with in the list that we, uh, we first started playing that I think is super, super important to why it's been feeling so good in my hands right now. Uh, Brothers in Arms plays exceptionally well with cards like Oasis Respite and Phantasmal Footsteps to let you block efficiently with blues. Um, of course, every blue in this deck matters because you want to be attacking with as many auras as you possibly can when and where possible. And having a blue that incidentally blocks four that can tag team with Phantasmal Footsteps to turn one of your blue auras that would normally be blocking two into something that is capable of blocking three is exceptionally strong and not an effect you should underappreciate. We've seen this one have some success in Icelander and in Oldham, and it is equally good in this very similar style of shell. Uh, I'm very ashamed to say it was not in my first version of this deck, but I would never, ever take it out now. It is easily one of the best blues the deck has available to it. Burn Them All is a card I get a lot of questions about because initially when you read the card in this deck with absolutely zero dragons, it makes very little sense. Of course, we're not playing dragons because we can't attack with them. We're not using Sasha Sandakai as a, as a weapon. So why on earth would we want access to burn them all in this deck given that it doesn't do anything? Well, it turns out having a four cost, like a, a zero cost aura that can attack for four immediately thanks to having go again itself can actually be exceptionally powerful. This deck also again relies on having a critical mass of auras to be able to push damage in turns where you are choosing to be the aggressor. Burn Them All lets you add an additional aura to the board and continue to attack thanks to again it having natural go again. Last but not least, it blocks three, which is something that other auras in this deck do not do. And that's a thing you really shouldn't underestimate in terms of evaluating how good a card can be. It's the only three block aura we can possibly play, and that is definitely worth something. Overall, the critical mass is very important. You do want to make sure you have a number of auras that are worth attacking with Iris with, regardless of the fact this doesn't actually have any text. Uh, one of the more interesting things you'll find when you play this deck is actually having an aura that your opponent cannot attack and cannot remove is also worth quite a lot. All the blue auras have Spectra. If your opponent wants them gone, they can hit them. If they want your Spectral Shields gone, they can challenge you and push enough aggro to make you have to respect the damage they're pushing to take those shields off the table. Burn Them All is the exception. They can never attack this. They don't get to remove it. It only gets to go away once you've run out of reds to be able to uh, keep it alive and that creates a really interesting deck building problem for this deck how do we have enough blues to make sure that we are operating and doing all the things we want to do while also having enough reds to be able to fuel burn them all as a payoff this archetype actually wants it's been a fantastic deck building dilemma and i've had a lot of fun with it so far one of the funniest interactions you'll find with this one is sometimes you can just play out haze bending and pass let your burn them all kill itself and create a spectral shield in the process and that's a play that uh, honestly comes up more than you might think this card is very good in the deck and I highly recommend playing the full three copies. Coalescence Mirage, you're going to find that a number of the blues in this deck are blue block threes, which is obviously very important for keeping yourself alive as you go through this game plan, but they're going to do one of maybe three things. They're either going to be a big-ish attack that on a non-functional hand we can throw at our opponent if we just have four blues and nothing else to do and still present a number of damage. They're going to have incidental go again so that we can, you know, go blue attack into red attack if we have nothing else going on and no auras in play. Or they're going to be like a mixture of that and somewhere in the middle. Coalescence Mirage is one of those cards that is like not 
the, a blue that you must play, but often going to be good enough. Attacking for five is not particularly powerful, but being able to pressure damage on blues is definitely worth something. This has a relevant ability if it's destroyed. Don't underestimate putting an aura into play for free while being able to push damage and pressure your opponent. You'll find this one plays exceptionally well with Phantasmal Footsteps. You can, of course, pitch a blue to attack with this. If your opponent then pops this card, you're going to be able to pay the remaining resource to be able to gain an action point back, put a zero-cost aura into the arena, and attack for four with Go Again with that aura. And that's a play pattern that you will find yourself using when and where necessary. Definitely not the best blue, but often good enough, in my opinion, to make the cut uh, once we want to keep that blue count nice and high. Doombreaker Center Pie up for you next. This one very much fits that role we talked about previously of having some incidental go again built into our blues. It does have to block three. That's very important. When all your blue auras block two, you need the rest of your blues to be blocking for three or four uh, in Brother's Arms case. Otherwise, they tend to not make the cut. Um, because you already have so many block twos. But this, again, gives us something that we're capable of doing once we have a somewhat clunky hand. We just draw four blues with no real auras in play. It means that we can still have a turn um, and pressure some damage by having some actual natural go again in the deck. Last but not least, we actually have uh, one and a half, I guess, uses for Ash in the sideboard of this deck, um, depending on the matchup in question. So that destroyed effect is actually not completely irrelevant. The Ash token will come up. This deck doesn't get to make Ash for free because, of course, it is so blue heavy. So having ways to naturally make it to enable those cards is worth a little something too. Ember Moore Center Pie, however, uh, kind of fits that role of okay blue attack to throw if you have a bad hand but mostly is a blue block three illusionist card you're gonna be blocking with this one a lot you don't tend to throw it at your opponent very much unless your hand is very very bad but it's a blue it enables all these play patterns for us to be able to pitch to our auras and of course in a pinch you keep a two card hand and just throw a six ball back at your opponent which off of a blue is not that bad and once again that destroyed effect does have some applications in certain versions of the matchup we're on Enlightened Strike currently. This one was actually recommended to me by a regular view, uh, viewer, Emu Shea, over the red copy of Doombreaker Senapai. Um, for the most part, I think this card is maybe replaceable in the deck. I haven't played enough games to know for sure whether it's the card that should be in this slot. But again, when we look at the play patterns this deck is trying to play, in either establishing auras and pushing damage with those, or keeping good two-card hands, Enlightened Strike is kind of the king of two-card hands. It's really good at letting you just come in for seven as an above-rate attack on two cards, put a card you didn't want to the bottom of your library. It, of course, can you know, maybe draw a card instead if you found a way to give this go again from an opposing quicken token from a coaxer commotion or something and also it can just give itself go again and be followed by another big attack so you will definitely have turns where you can attack for five with go again into miraging metamorph off of your tunic or into another big red attack that we'll get to in the list a little bit later and the flexibility of this card makes it one of the better big attacks in theory i've definitely not played enough games with it to be sure but i am on board with it being better than red doing breaker center pie i'm trying to find that balance between blues and reds for the cards we want to enable so currently it makes the cut in that slot we're going to talk about the 12 blue auras at the same time. I'll scroll down just a little bit here before we carry on. you notice that we have Haze Bending, Passing Mirage, Pierce Reality, and Shimmers of Silver as the four uh, blue auras that we all play three of that we're allowed to play in this deck. So this kind of covers them all. For the most part, Shimmers of Silver is obviously the best one at being a weapon. Uh, this thing that's attacking for five immediately, if it's ever left alive, and then six, and then seven, it's really scary. That's a lot of damage off of this card. Uh, and it should be respected by your opponent as a result. But for the most part, these are kind of the core of the deck. Uh, they are, you know, things you play out when you have your action point available to establish to a board, force your opponent to come and challenge them and attack them instead of attacking you. Otherwise, you will be able to give them all go again and attack for four, attack for four, attack for four, attack for four because of Iris of Reality. It's very much reminiscent of Prism's play style and that if your opponent doesn't respect your auras, they are going to get buried by them. Uh, so we play every single blue aura that we can in this deck, which means we are playing all 12, regardless of how powerful they are. But the ones that we definitely want to see often and regularly, Shimmers of Silver and of 
of course, Hayes bending. Hayes bending, the one that pays us off for having other blue auras in play, makes it difficult for our opponent to challenge them. Plays very well with burn them all, creating a spectral shield. Uh, and even when it's killed itself, creates a spectral shield left over, which often just means you're attacking for four guaranteed with the shield on the following turn that your opponent chooses to take this off the table. Definitely, definitely the most powerful two. You definitely shouldn't underestimate Passing Mirage and Pierce Reality, but they are mostly afterthoughts in terms of the effects that they have. Passing Mirage will come up sometimes in matchups where you want to, of course, keep your big Phantasm attack safe for a turn. You'll definitely find yourself using Mage Master Boots to play out double Passing Mirage from a pitch stacked game to set up a big Phantasmoclasm or something similar against Oldium or other Guardians sometimes. But for the most part, they are blue auras that can attack with Iris and their text is not overly relevant uh, on Passing Mirage and Pierce Reality. The other two, definitely relevant abilities and tick all those other boxes as well. Miraging Metamorph is a egregious card. This thing is insane and a very, very, very powerful, especially in this archetype. We kind of talked earlier about how it can be a seven card attack, uh, sorry, a seven power attack from just your tunic resource in many, many matchups. It's also just great on those two card hands, plays very well with getting your action point back from Phantasmal Footsteps, but for the most part, no one ever wants to pop this in this deck because you're going to have it all in play. This thing will make you another Spectral Shield, make you another Shimmers of Silver, make you another haze bending and though uh, it'll even make you more copies of burn them all um which obviously can stay in play and be hard for your opponent to remove from the table this is just possibly your best attack if not definitely your best attack and often very very hard to efficiently block for your opponent and nobody ever wants to pop this thing it's an insane card very very powerful and i wouldn't remove it uh, if you if you paid me to Oasis Respite is a card that I'm a really big fan of in this deck. Again, between Brothers in Arms, Phantasmal Footsteps, and itself, we can quite often utilize our blues in our opponent's turn to be able to block efficiently. There are a number of matchups where this just turns off Rosetta Thorn. This is obviously very good against the Wizards in circumventing things like Aether Ice Vein, or in Kano's case, a big Aether Wildfire. And for the most part, it just acts as a defense reaction that often blocks five instead of blocking four, uh, that plays very well with, the, with Phantasmal Footsteps, which you know you're always going to have available because it's in play. Play, uh, at the start of the game in the most matchups where you start with it. As a result, it tends to find itself being a better defense reaction than something like Fate for Scene, uh, and I'm pretty happy to start it in just about every matchup. I think this card is a poor design and uh, is just very, very strong, probably shouldn't exist, uh, and I'm more than happy to have it in this blue heavy shell that is going to be happy to pay for it. One of the most important things about Oasis Respite is to remember that a lot of our blues block two and every single time we can create a situation where those blues aren't blocking two they're instead blocking more than two so that our average card is blocking three that's a trade up for us when we need to turn those cards into blocking potential and phantasmal footsteps and oasis respite help us in doing that in allowing those blues to be worth three points of damage prevention turning two cards into six block which is something this deck is very eager to do in a number of situations with so many auras that do block two very powerful way of utilizing those resources and a card that I don't think I'd be cutting anytime soon either. Phantasmoclasm is one of my most uh, favourites, I should say, inclusions in this deck. It's something that we didn't start with initially when we were building this list, but we put it in when we were looking for more big attacks that played well on two card hands. And this, of course, is way above rate coming in for nine and possibly even removing poppers out of the way in a pinch. Uh, this card is very, very good when your deck contains 33 to 36 blues because it is just playable on two card hands all the time excuse me, as a volley for nine. Of course, really soft to poppers. There is going to be a number of situations where this thing just blocks for three in, an, in matchups where your opponent is popper heavy because you don't really want to be sending it in to attack them uh, if not required. But against basically every matchup that is light on poppers and doesn't play any, so that, you know, playing somewhere between three and four, uh, the card is just phenomenal and pushes way, way more damage than any other attack in this spot, which is why it makes the cut, because we can basically always play it on a two-card hand if we want to. Phantasmal Haze is a favourite of mine. I started originally by only playing the blues that attacked for six, uh, because they make me a Spectral Shield token if they get popped, which is a very relevant destroy trigger that no other effect can replicate. Obviously, creating auras for this deck is just very, very powerful because they are our weapons and represent more damage that our opponent has to stop us from swinging with. So being able to create an aura upon destruction is a very good ability to have on one of your big attacks that plays into that other game plan of attacking with a big attack 
back off of a two card hand in matchups where that matters. It was so good as a blue in fact that I chose to start playing the reds to be able to push eight damage and do a good wounded bull impression uh, sending this thing in into our opponent. So very strong on two card hands, pressures a lot of damage and very solid if your opponent does have their poppers because you can then make a spectral shield, rebuy an action point from phantasmal footsteps and attack for four off the phantasmal sh uh, the, the spectral shield as well uh, which is a play pattern that comes up more than you might think on blue heavy hands where this card was tucked in the arsenal really big fan of this card in this shell happy to play both the reds and the blues spears of surrealty very much another copy of um doom breaker center pie as a blue fits the same role blue block three for the most part and then when we have all these blue heavy hands uh, that don't have a lot to do if our auras have been cleared by our opponent it gives us a way of having some natural go again sweeping blow a bit innocuous this one um Definitely could be another blue. We've we've explored a few things, played around with a few things to see what fits. But for the most part, this is another way of having some incidental go again on a blue if we need it in a pinch. And it will help us make some ash tokens for our sideboard cards in a number of matchups as well. But this is going to be the one that you block with the most in matchups where those cards don't matter. Or you have a surplus of ash already as it's you know not going to be doing a whole lot coming in for one. Uh, but it fills a role, it fills a niche, does a number of things well in creating ash, giving you some incidental go again and being a blue block through. Three, uh, for all other intensive purposes so it does currently make the cut so that is your core there those are the cards you'll play in every matchup we'll move on to our sideboard choices down here most of which again you're looking to play nine of these cards in any matchup apart from the armor of course which you'll tag in and out as needed. Unsurprisingly, we do have access to AB3 in our sideboard. There are a number of matchups where AB1 is required to keep your Spectral Shield safe, and then against things like Icelander and Kano, we do want access to the full AB3 because our deck, of course, is so heavy on blues. We want to make sure that if we're spending a card to prevent arcane damage, we are preventing as much as we possibly can, and that is why you see Crown of Reflection, Silent Stilettos, and Nolroon Gloves. Crown of Reflection does actually have some corner case use in this deck as well. There will be times where you attack for four with a Spectral Shield, then use the crown to pop the shield, put another aura into play, and attack for four with it as well. Definitely a line you want to keep your eyes open for. It will come up a little more than you think it would. So that kind of covers the pieces of Arcane Barrier. We've looked at Mage Master Boots briefly already as well when talking about who do we play this against? Most most of the time you're playing it against decks that have a lot of poppers and phantasmal footsteps. It's not great at blocking in those matchups uh, or facilitating any real plays. And the high upside of being able to go double blue aura at some point in the game or establish two copies of Passing Mirage on the same turn is worth significantly more to you than that no block maybe action point effect that Phantasmal Footsteps has to offer, but I am definitely interested in testing it more. Just going on first in, on turn zero in basically every matchup, as I don't know whether or not it's worthwhile there just yet for that high roll potential. The rest of these cards, however, have very much dedicated spots and definitely worth looking into what they're going for. The five you see separated between the armor are the cards I am the most skeptical of and do think could be changed for other things, depending on how the format evolves, what you're trying to beat, and whether you need space for other cards. The rest of the cards I'm actually very happy with, and I'd be surprised if I cut anytime soon. So we have three copies of Erase Face. Erase Face here is my popper of choice. Do you need a popper for the Dromai Mirror? Honestly, probably not. At the moment, I, I started with Findle's Fighting Spirit in the list because I thought I was going to need a way of handling opposing dragons. Um, but for the most part, you're able to attack them down with auras because... Your dragons have Spectra, your opposing dragons do not have Spectra, uh, which means you can kill off a lot of theirs at the same time with auras that are in play, and they really can't do the same for your blue auras um, that they can for your Spectral Shields. So for the most part, the poppers felt they were mostly irrelevant, but I haven't found anything I was happy to replace them with just yet. The reason this became a race face was actually because the Viscerai matchup felt pretty hard. It can be quite difficult to protect your Spectral Shields from opposing uh, arcane damage in that matchup. So I made the switch to turn my popper into a card that was better in that matchup to kind of help improve it all around. There's a good chance, as I say, this could be something else if you don't need the popper in the mirror. Uh, if we find that to be the case over the course of more testing, I imagine we'll look to turn this into something that is better against Viscerite and maybe another card, uh, another class as well, as opposed to being there for just the mirror and viscerite. Same could kind of be said about the Invoke Thamai in this case. We, of course, can never attack with Thamai. We don't have access to Storm of Sandakai. So this is very much just an aura, essentially, that cannot attack for us, that shuts off our Icelander opponent's turn. Now, 
This was a consideration originally because I wasn't sure how good this deck was going to be into Icelander, but so far it has felt very, very good, and it wouldn't shock me if you don't need to dedicate this slot to Icelander to have that kind of safety valve to keep you safe and buy you time to set up your auras. Um, because the blue auras are already so hard for them to handle in general, you probably don't require this. So it wouldn't shock me if this became something else in time, but for now, it was a dedicated sideboard card to the Icelander matchup, uh, and you'll see that in sideboarding. It doesn't really come in anywhere else. There's a good chance it should just be something else. Do I know what that is yet, however? No, more testing will be required. Prismatic Shield is secretly a very, very powerful card in this deck. Of course, being able to just generate three auras that can potentially attack for 12 in a pinch after you've taken a bunch of damage could be quite quite scary for opponents and represents kind of like a 15 point life swing after those shields are done preventing damage as well so the card can be quite worth quite a lot for just two cards the shield itself and the blue required to pay for it um, which is very very interesting very very powerful you'll find this card gets boarded in in a lot of the matchups where we don't want our other defensive tools or if we think our opponent can't pressure our auras. The card is surprisingly poor in matchups where our opponent represents arcane damage on the regular as it can be quite hard to protect the additional spectral shields from being popped by that arcane damage and we prefer to play other defensive toys. But in matchups like Guardian or like you know, other matchups where they don't pressure us anywhere near as well, we can block them out successfully and there is very little arcane damage to worry about. Prismatic Shield represents auras at instant speed that can pressure a lot of damage that the opponent wasn't ready for, especially if you can set this up in the arsenal and play it out off of a blue meaning you're guaranteed to push 12 from three other blues in your hand and keep those shields alive as well of course downsides are this card doesn't block so there are a number of matchups where it doesn't make the cut including most of the brutes um, where it not blocking and being stuck in your hand uh, can be a bit of a liability in those cases Sand cover is our main reason to make any kind of ash whatsoever. It's the reason you see uh, things like sweeping blow in the deck and of course the ability to pitch reds in a pinch if we really have to. You'll find that the reds don't pitch very well in this deck so making ash that way is not particularly easy. For the most part you will be looking for Doombreaker, uh, a pitch to a, a Phantasmal Footsteps. Uh, or maybe sweeping blow to make the ash for you to facilitate these but unsurprisingly against guardians big dominate attacks wizards chunks of arcane damage and a number of other classes sand cover being a award four to protect you from four arcane or four damage overall uh, quite a powerful effect and one that you want access to and it's definitely worth being able to utilize that ash in a pinch Sink Below and that all you got are defense reactions of choice in this deck. Sink Below gets played quite a lot into a number of matchups where blocking for four is a good rate. You'll find turning off hit triggers of a snatch, uh, stopping Arachne's on hit contracts being fulfilled, or even things just like, you know, being able to block Dory's Dawnblade or play better into dominated attacks from your Guardians. I mean, this card is very flexible and will be making the cut for you a lot of the time. That all you got is definitely more targeted towards classes who are playing weapons that will turn it on, being able to replace place your your that all you got with a blue that will then let an aura attack is quite a good transaction because you are then blocking three and essentially pushing four damage off of the same card uh, making a card worth seven is very very strong in matchups where this card allows you to do that so play it into your rune blades who have small attacks and rosetta thorn play it into your ninjas who have many small attacks that you're happy to block naturally and kadachis it's even pretty playable into things like arachne thanks to spiders bite often triggering it and turning it on as well just be careful this thing can get stuck in your arsenal sometime if your opponent chooses to just keep clearing out your spectra auras so be very careful about how many auras you extend when this thing is in your arsenal it might get stuck there with no way to get it out uh, last but not least, we have this round's on me, a blue that I'm currently a really big fan of in a number of different decks. This is very strong into the ninjas and rune blades and stopping their go wide turns from being anywhere near as powerful, um, which is a, a fantastic effect that is very, very strong right now. Of course, we're able to use this to pay for our auras and it blocks three in a pinch as well, which is just kind of everything that we want a blue to do and have some somewhat sometimes relevant game text. So being very good in the ninja matchups, being reasonable against rune blades, stopping those on hit, stopping those breaks points is definitely a valuable effect for a blue to have and we can get use out of the extra card we draw in our own turn as well often just being able to pay for another aura to attack or maybe even send in a big red attack afterwards and make our opponent's life really awkward if they want to have a reasonable turn to pressure us in return makes this rounds on me a very strong blue for this archetype so there you go this current list is available for you to import from uh, fabry in the description box if you want to get onto talishar and play it yourself let me know what you think and it will come with the 
the entire sideboard guide we're going to talk through in just a minute as well. Uh, definitely still a work in progress, definitely some, still some cards that could be adjusted and changed, but I'm pretty happy with most of where this is, and I'm looking forward to keeping the work going on this to see whether or not I can make it into a viable deck in, uh, in time. Uh, but yeah, so we're going to walk real briefly through some sideboard plans here. As we kind of say um, beforehand, there is just a chunk of... Uh, of availability you won't see it popping down here on OBS unfortunately but we do have every single matchup available uh, for you to browse if you go click the link in the description box below so we're gonna start on Arachne basically what I'm gonna do is show you what should be left in the deck box in the the bottom of the screen below and then walk you through why the cards we're boarding in are good in this matchup so Arachne is actually the only matchup we board up to 63 we do not want to be getting milled out by Arachne over the course of a game and having a few extra cards in the deck goes a long way to make sure that doesn't happen in spots where we don't want to be blocking it too much uh, to push damage from our auras. Um, so you'll find that we play 63 here. The cards you're looking to have left in the box are going to be your sand covers, your thermites, and your erase faces. You're playing your normal stock bunch of equipment in this matchup, uh, so don't need to worry about swapping anything out for that as well. Unsurprisingly, this round's on me, uh, and that all you got very, very good in the face of Spider's Bites. Definitely an interaction you're looking to have come up. Sink Below is a fantastic card in this matchup to block off those important on-hit triggers. They have a lot of breakpoints for them on cards that naturally attack for four so being able to block an attack and then be able to keep yourself safe from things like cut to the chase definitely relevant on a card like this one as well it's very very good at naturally stopping those contracts from being fulfilled prismatic shield a very strong card here as well arachne doesn't tend to go super wide if you don't want them to you can turn off those black techs if you really care uh, as a result you're able to often take a small hit and be at a pressure back with a number of auras uh, and then keep your auras safe uh, in the future. The Prismatic Shields kind of serve another role in this matchup too, where we kind of talked briefly about those breakpoints a moment ago, uh, being able to uh, attack for four as Arachne quite a lot, and you'll find that your Prismatic Shield in this matchup, start attacking with those shields, and then slowly but surely you'll block out attacks and let a shield stop the on hit uh, each turn as well, because you don't mind losing one shield each turn as you go. Um, and soaking up those on hits, stopping those contracts being fulfilled, and stopping your opponent from rebuying their armor. So 12 cards coming in this matchup instead of 9, uh, because they're all very powerful, and we'd rather be on 63 against Arachne. Azalea, of course, a deck that is not particularly common right now, but one that we have some good tools against. Uh, you should see right there the cards that you're looking to not have in, in this matchup. No shields, no erase faces, no thermizal, that all you got. Your armor suite is the normal stock armor suite in this matchup. Uh, stand cover sink below, this round's on me. You're definitely looking to play this round's on me, mostly as just another blue. You need to be able to have 36 blues in this matchup to pay for all your stuff. You will be blocking quite a lot. So it makes sense that you want access to the extra blues on your big payoff turns. But Sand Cover and Sink Below kind of explain themselves. Big dominated attacks. We want as many ways as possible to not take chunks of damage from those attacks. So fairly intuitive stuff on the cards we're boarding in in this one. On to Bolton. But in a matchup, once again, where the armor does not change, we're keeping our Mage Master Boots uh, and our, our Arcane Barrier stuff in the board. Uh, again, most of the reds not making the cut this time around. Uh, no Sand Covers, no Prismatic Shields, no Erase Faces, and no Thermize. So we're playing that battle we got very good into Centauri Saber and a number of the small attacks that Bolton has to charge to get his stuff going. Sink Below, not the best card against Bolton, but pretty good at stopping very important on hits in a pinch. But definitely not the best card in the matchup, just kind of better than the other options options we have down here uh, in general and that this round's on me offering you the 36 blues in this matchup and very very good in the face of Centauri Sabres when comboing off to keep that turn uh, lower on damage than it might be otherwise so uh, pretty reasonable blue to have access to against Bolton. Bravo coming up for us. It's the first matchup where we tag in Mage Master Boots always. Phantasmal Footsteps just doesn't really do an awful lot against Bravo. You'll see the cards again otherwise that we're not playing left here down at the bottom if you're unsure. What are we playing? Well, again, Defense Reaction, super powerful. Sand Cover, Sink Below, going to help us in the face of those dominated attacks at keeping our life total high and those crush triggers from happening. And then Prismatic Shield is an all-star in this matchup. Very, very hard for Guardians to attack you multiple times, especially if they want to be clearing away all auras that you have in play so when your opponent just hits one of your auras playing a prismatic shield and pushing back a chunk of damage is one hell of a tempo play definitely the matchup where this card shines uh, the most in my opinion so pretty happy to have access to it in this matchup Briar coming up for you next. Briar, the first matchup where you'll notice we tag in the Null Rune gloves over the, the Wave of Reality. It's important in this matchup to have access to some Null Rune. I know that sounds counterintuitive because for the most part, 
Uh, you know, they don't make that many rune chants. It's only really attacking with Rosetta Thorn, which is two arcane, not one. Uh, but you'll find, for example, we have a number of spots between Brothers in Arms, Oasis, Respite, and Phantasmal Footsteps where we have a spare resource knocking around in this matchup. And preventing a damage from Rosetta Thorn in those spots can be very, very powerful. More importantly, however, they're really good at challenging your Spectral Shields. So being able to save one and prevent arcane damage in a pinch uh, from a, a rune chant from Grasp of the Arc Knight can be quite important. Because if you turn up with no null rune, your opponent is just incentivized to make a rune chant from Grasp every turn and you will never keep a shield alive. So you need to have access to Null Rune Gloves to give yourself the opportunity to keep a shield alive in a spot where you want it. Otherwise, we're not playing a lot of the reds again in this matchup. No shields, no Thermize, Erase Faces, or Sand Covers. The cards getting the nod, of course. Sink Below, very, very good at those important on hits, such as Snatch. This round's on me, very good in the face of Rosetta Thorn. And, uh, sorry, this that, that you got very good in the face of Rosetta Thorn. And this round's on me, a card basically custom fit for this matchup. Very good at stopping our opponent from going wide and turning off those break points. Points. And that's the reason why those are the nine cards that make the cut on boarding in. Over to Dash. Dash at the moment is a bit of an interesting one. I'm not sure how we're supposed to be boarding in this matchup because I'm not sure how our opponent sees us. But a lot of the dashes I've played against so far in testing have been very aggressive and have turned over Teclo Pounder. So I'm operating on that premise at the moment. Of course, if they turn over Chamber and try and utilize that alongside uh, Teclo Plasma Pistol, maybe our plan has to change. That being said, Phantasmal Footsteps very strong against Teclo Plasma Pistol and definitely a card you want to be playing there. And the rest of the armor seems like it's better than Null Rune Alternative. In terms of cards that we are choosing to play, however, we are not playing Sink Below, Sand Cover, Thamai, or Erase Face. This round's on me. Can be pretty reasonable against Dash, but for the most part, it blocks three uh, and will offer you uh, the, the blue you need to be able to pay for your stuff. But every now and then, you're happy to turn off breakpoints from zero to 60 uh, and reduce the size of the gunshots. It will come up periodically. Uh, that we got, definitely the best thing we could be looking to have if our opponent turns over the Teclo Plasma Pistol. It's definitely much worse in the face of Hanabi blaster um, so definitely something to keep in mind that maybe this card isn't good enough but for the most part it scores enough blocks on random 0 to 60 smaller blue attacks and pistol shots at the moment I'm pretty happy to still have it in the deck last but not least prismatic shield quite strong in this deck in general um, dash is very obvious about where it stops um, it's attack chain if it doesn't boost anymore or it doesn't have any way to give the pistol go again You will often know where things are going to end and you can decide whether or not making auras is going to be beneficial for you overall And the damage these prevent incidentally is certainly not nothing that being said I do think this matchup is quite difficult dash naturally has a good handful of poppers built into the deck uh, And they are able to play Achilles accelerator, which of course is very very strong against you uh, When it turns out that what you're looking for is uh, it's gonna be you know not having them gain extra action points after killing your spectral auras. So uh, I do think the matchup is pretty hard. Opponents should be pretty good into you at clearing your auras and being able to pop attacks periodically. Uh, so I look forward to kind of evolving this one going forward and seeing how that lands. Over to Dory. Dory, a matchup I've not actually playtested yet, so this is all theory craft in general. Uh, normal armor suite, pretty happy to see for the most part. And unsurprisingly, a lot of what we want in this matchup is going to be defense reactions. Defense reactions and more defense reactions at stopping Dawnblade from hitting us. Uh, Prismatic Shield, often not good enough because, again, not blocking is a bit of a liability against Dory. Uh, and they can choose to make us leak damage in a lot of spots and eat those shields if they really care. As a result, Sand Cover, Sink Below, that all you got. Definitely the cards we're interested in playing here as our pseudo-defense reaction suite to make us better against Dawnblade all around. Uh, that all you got, of course, very rarely going to be drawing a card against Dory, but it is still a defense reaction, which is often just going to be good enough. Over to Dramai. Dramai, a matchup that I'm currently playing Null Rune Gloves to be able to be a little bit better against opposing copies of Asvali and Burn Them All. Definitely a consideration of keeping our Spectral Shields safe and making sure they don't immediately die to arcane damage. Mage Master Boots also gets the nod here. For the most part, I don't think uh, Prismatic... Uh, Phantasmal Footsteps is going to be blocking very much or necessarily giving us any extra action points either uh, because obviously most of our opponent's attacks are illusionist attacks which do not trigger Phantasm. So currently on Mage Master Boots uh, at the moment in this matchup, we'll look forward to seeing whether or not that remains the case. Uh, in terms of cards that we are not playing, this is the matchup where we board out Oasis Respite. I'm fairly certain you do not want any defensive cards in this matchup if you can help it. Uh, so for that reason, Respite, Sand Cover and Sink Below remaining in the board alongside Wave of 
of reality. We want to go all the way up to 36 blues in this matchup. This round on me also has incidental benefit at turning off 8th Ash Wings over the course of a game, uh, which could definitely come up in a pinch. Uh, that's all you've got is going to be the defensive reaction that replaces itself. We don't really want to be playing defensive reactions in this matchup, but it is the best one by a sizable margin, as it will at least let you draw another card after blocking an Ashwing or something similar. And then Prismatic Shield, a very, very strong card in this matchup, actually, and letting you kind of take heat from dragons and then just come on back and clear all the dragons out immediately, uh, because you are able to arsenal this card, draw up to four blues, and just take a hit from your opponent's turn. Uh, most of the time, it's not going to be too big of a damage turn uh, from Dromai, so you can then just pitch a blue, play this, and attack with all three shields to clear out three dragons that you need to remove from the table. It's very, very good at doing that, at creating a burst of attackers in a pinch. Uh, so really a big fan of Prismatic Shield in this matchup as well. Over to Fi. Fi, unfortunately... Um, how do I put this? It's no better for you than normal uh, normal Dramai, Dragon-based Dramai. The matchup is still pretty horrible um, from what I currently understand. I've not managed to find a way of making that not the case. Uh, because they just pressure you with so much damage, it's really hard to get your feet under you. That being said, you do have more big attacks than normal Dromai. Uh, you can just volley large Phantasm attacks back at Fi, which he you know, basically never has poppers for you to deal with that. Uh, so the combination of things like Phantasmal Haze, like Phantasmoclasm, like Miraging Metamorph, can give you an avenue to victory in a pinch. Uh, that being said, we are very much not playing Prismatic Shield or Sand Cover in this matchup. You can very much struggle to find yourself with an Ash available, uh, having not been pitching reds or anything uh, in this matchup. And Prismatic Shield not blocking is a huge liability, given that it, all it will do is protect you from three damage anyway in this matchup. Uh, so for the most part, this that all you got, this round's on me. Again, anti-aggro tools that are very, very strong here sink below kind of the same premise which is why those nine are the cards that make the cut in this matchup Icelander Icelander the first matchup where we're going to switch ourselves to AB3 we're keeping our tunic and our iris in that situation uh, so armor kit down here Basically what you would expect, given that we've swapped in AB3. Uh, no erase faces, no sink blows, no that all you've got. Unsurprisingly, these cards not particularly relevant in the Icelander matchup. You'll notice that we are playing a Prismatic Shield here, and that's because, of course, we're bringing in the two copies of Thamai. I actually think Prismatic Shield is pretty reasonable into Icelander, but it can be hard sometimes to get it off and not just have your shields get eaten by a Waning Moon, um, which makes it a little bit of a liability in spots where your opponent's happy to hold their moon uh, and see what happens. Doesn't happen too often, but definitely a thing that can happen if they expect Prismatic Shield. Um, Thamai, of course, very, very powerful in this matchup. Uh, and, you know, not sure if we need it, but it is currently going to be here. In terms of the other cards that make the cut alongside Thamai and the Shields, we've got these three copies of Sand Cover, which unsurprisingly are very, very strong against Icelander at preventing four arcane damage from those big uh, Aether effects, uh, basically stopping your hand from being ripped apart. Uh, in spots where you need to prevent it. Um, unsurprisingly, very, very strong there. And this round's on me, uh, basically, just upping your blue count. Very unlikely to cast this one into Icelander, because the attack reduction doesn't matter. But having the full amount of blues in this matchup is going to be very strong at keeping that arcane damage in check uh, when we need to. Uh, so definitely something that we're interested in doing in this matchup. Over to Kano. Unsurprisingly, Kano is much the same thought process, except we don't need to play Thamai. Uh, for mine, not a card that does very much in the face of Kano. They're not going to be doing much in your turn anyway, because for the most part, they're going to be blocking the big Phantasm attacks that you are sending at their skull in your turn and doing their own stuff in their turn. Uh, so Thamai, not really a card that we worry about too much. This matchup, for the most part, is pretty good just because they don't interact with our auras very well whatsoever. Um, Shimmers of Silver is just kind of an unfair card for Kano to have to handle. As a result, Prismatic Shield, Sand Cover, and this round on me are the nine cards that make the cut from the board. They are just more ways of preventing arcane damage in a pinch, uh, stopping those important Aether Wildfire turns, and brings us up to 36 blues to have as many blues as we can in the matchup. Okie dokie, over to Katsu. Katsu, a matchup that I haven't played too much, but, you know, we have played a little bit. We're basically operating on the premise that our opponent is going to be Kitty Katsu when we board the way that we are in this situation. Uh, so, again, no Prismatic Shields, no Sand Covers here. Staying on the Phantasmal Footsteps, very, very good at blocking in this matchup in a pinch if you need it to. Uh, this round's on me, unsurprisingly very good against Katsu. It basically often turns off their turn because of how many small attacks they play. Same thing with this, uh, that all you got. Of course, just shutting off those small attacks, those Kidachi Swings, replacing the card you blocked 
with uh, makes for a pretty good exchange all around. And Sink Below going to be very important at turning, turning off those Tiger Swipes, those Snatches, and other four attack on hits that you, you particularly care about hitting you and doing some crazy, crazy things. So could be quite a difficult matchup. Opponents very, very good at going wide. Um, but we have as many toys as we can and as many tools as we can to help make that matchup better all around, in my opinion. Over to Levia. Levia, a matchup I don't really want to see. I haven't tested it at all uh, so far, so this is all very much theory craft. But a matchup that I expect to have many, many poppers, so we're on Mage Master Boots to try and establish those two auras early, because Phantasmal Footsteps shouldn't do very much for us. In terms of cards that we are not playing, we're keeping the Thermize, Erase Faces, Prismatic Shields, and That All You Got tucked away in the board. Um, playing this round's on me, playing Sink Below, playing Sand Cover. For the most part, I do find defense reactions are one of your best bets into the face of Brute, allowing you to be able to soak up that damage being pushed through from Dominate as best as possible. Uh, this round's on me, very much a case of being a blue block three in this matchup to help pay for things in a pinch. It is not fantastic. We're not designed to have a particularly good sideboard plan here against Brute. It's not a matchup I'm super worried about seeing too much of currently. Um, and for the most part, in the past, these pseudo defense reactions have have been the most powerful thing for me uh, in those matchups with decks like this. Sand cover, maybe a bit dodgy if you don't have an Ash available, but probably better than just playing something akin to Prismatic Shield, where you can't guarantee the block anyway. And that all you got on Erase Face, just not particularly good cards against Brute, in my opinion. Unsurprisingly, Reinar is essentially the same plan. No need to go into too much more detail. If you want to see why we board the way we do against Reinar, it is exactly the same as it is against Leviah currently. So you can go and hear what I just said about that if you skip to this point in the video. Okie dokie. Lexi coming up for us next. Traditional armor suite against Lexi. Uh, mostly looking to be defensive with the sideboard tools we play here. Prismatic shield not quite making the cut. It can be kind of hard to keep your shields alive if the Lexi is going wider. Um, which they certainly can do off the back of Voltaire. So they can be a bit of a liability and often quite hard to keep safe. Um, Thamai, Erase Face, not particularly cards you're worried about. And that all you got, often just not ever scoring a card because it doesn't block anything that is small enough. Lexi's attacks often big enough to make this card not block efficiently. As a result, Sand Cover Sink Below are our defense choices in this matchup, looking to keep those dominated arrows, all those bigger arrows, from scoring their very powerful on hits. And this round's on me. Can in a pinch also stop those on hits, make those arrows smaller and easier to block, but mostly again a blue block three in this matchup to increase that blue count because we expect to be blocking quite a lot. We want our hands to be heavier on blues so our auras can still attack while we're blocking uh, over the course of a game. Over to Oldham. Oldham, a matchup where we are playing those Mage Master Boots. Again, Phantasmal Footsteps not offering you an awful lot in this matchup, in my opinion. Doesn't really get you anywhere. You're not uh, not achieving anything or blocking with it. So we want to have the chance at establishing those two blue auras on turn zero, if and where possible, or setting up that double passing Mirage turn later in the game. Uh, again, not really too much of a surprise here. Erase Faces Demise, that all you got. It's really not cards that you're looking for in this matchup. We are lighter on blues here because we want access to these uh, powerful effects that are good at uh, pushing damage in the form of Prismatic Shield. Uh, also, against Dominate in a pinch, you can make more special shields to make you better into Oak and Old or make you better into Macho Grande. But for the most part, you'll take a hit from the Oldham opponent, establish the three shields and push 12 damage, a very, very common play pattern. Uh, once they can only attack you once over the course of a turn. Uh, Sand Cover and Sink Below, definitely your more defensive toys designed to let you be good into dominate attacks and keep yourself safe from crush triggers uh, or you know things that are going to be potentially problematic for you. They also block a Winter's Whale all by themselves, which is a very, very powerful thing to have access to when you want to keep a three card hand and attack with three auras as well. So do keep that one in mind as well. Over to, last but not least, good old Viserai over here. Another matchup where we slip in the Nolrun gloves over the uh, the wave of reality. Mostly, again, because Rune Chance will make it very, very hard for us to protect our Spectral Shields. Uh, we don't want to have them popped immediately by having no Nolrun. Like, losing your wave because you have no Nolrun, your opponent just makes a Rune Chant from Grasp of the Ark Knight, is very bad for you. And you are going to want the ability to shut those Rune Chants down over the course of a game and try and protect your shields in spots where you really, really need to keep them alive. That being said, I found this matchup to be quite hard so far. It was definitely the reason why Erase Face was still the popper of choice in this list currently. But the rest of the armor remains the same. 
You're going to find that we, of course, have no use for Prismatic Shield or Sand Cover in this matchup. Uh, giving an Ash Ward 4 in the face of Rune Chance can be exceptionally awkward, and keeping your shield safe in the face of Rune Chance also exceptionally awkward. No need for Thamai here, keeping the rest of the Arcane Barrier in the board. The nine cards we are choosing to play here are going to be that all you got, obviously very, very strong in the face of Rosetta Thorn, replacing itself and drawing more cards. Sink Below, a strong one in order to keep those on-hit triggers from things uh, like, you know, consuming Volition uh, away from you, but also line up very, very well against a number of uh, the attacks coming out of this right anyway. They can be quite big coming in for seven in the form of things like Shred of the Skull Form, or even things like Dread Triptych or Rune Flash happen to naturally attack for four, making it a very clean block from a thing like Sink Below. It's going to be important to block those attacks efficiently when you're looking to keep your opponent off of Mothri in Skies and try and keep your shields alive from the incoming arcane damage as well. It race face the last card that sees play in this matchup. Obviously, a very, very strong card against Viscerai specifically. If you could stop him being a rune blade for the turn, he's not going to be able to make any rune chance, and that will often buy you a window to keep some shields safe and pressure some damage back at your opponent. All right. So that is where we are currently on Iris Dromai. Definitely a deck that is still being a work in progress for myself. Could definitely see some things changing as we continue over the course of the metagame. Uh, definitely still working on what toys go where and whether or not, especially things like Erase Face and Thamai are required in the sideboard slots moving forward and what the exact selection of blues should be, how many reds we need for Burn Them All, so on and so forth. So if you've got any thoughts, any feedback after you play the deck yourself, by all means, leave me a comment in the description box below. Let me know what you think if you've been playing it yourself or come and find me over on Twitter at Howling Minds. Let me know how it's going for you and we can hopefully work on this deck together. But until next time, I have been Howling Minds, you have been amazing and this has been... A deck tech for Iris Dromai. Thanks for hanging out.